We're looking at Romans chapter 7 and 8. So we're going to combine these two together. And as you'll notice around this place, it is a celebration of Valentine's as well. And so I thought, well, it's good to get a little bit of Valentine's humor out there if we can. Um, gentleman described how he first came up with his uh, first piece of humor from Valentine's. He was stopped at a roadside stand. It, this stand sold fruit, vegetables, and crafts. So as he went in to pay, he noticed that the, gal, the girl at the back was painting a new sign. And this was as big as the original sign. Um, and he said, why the new sign? Well, the girl said, my boyfriend just didn't approve of the old one. It was our com combination business. And, and I, uh, I, I really thought it was time for us to make a change. And here's what the sign read. Local honey dates nuts. <laughs> and she had, had a, a, a strong point. Um, it was that they were all the things that they were selling, but it needed some commas. Local honey, comma, dates, comma, nuts, comma, or period. <laughs> a modern happy Valentine card read, now that you are in my life at this time of life, when I'm getting very old, everything is now starting to click. My knees, my back, my neck. So, um, Here's another seniors uh, that were out on a stroll for Valentine's Day. The first noticed the trees and said, it's windy. The next replied, no way, it's Thursday. To which the last in the group said, me too, let's go have a soda. <laughs> well, obviously that's a, that's a sort of uh, hearing joke, but... God proves his love to us, doesn't he? he, he this, uh, this Tuesday is Valentine's Day, and this is the day when all the men are supposed to give their friends or their wife a special gift to show that he loves her. I'm not sure how, how often that happens, and sometimes a special gift might be just shoveling the walk, but popular <laughs> gifts include you know, ca candy and flowers and jewelry, but the Lord gave us a much costlier gift in the person of his son. For while we were still sinners, Christ died uh, for each one of us, for the ungodly, for the sinners, for those who are his enemies. So the gift of Christ is a proof of God's love. So we can't go very far wrong when we speak about the God who is love promoting a day of real love. G.K. Chesterton was uh, working for the Daily Observer in London. And he was asked by a woman in her letter to write a series of articles explaining what was wrong with the world today. So the following day, Chesterton penned this classic reply. He said, Madam, I will tell you what is wrong with the world in two words. I am. That was a humble and an honest reply. I am the problem. I am what's wrong with the world. Our hearts are wrong. In Romans 7, Paul looks at the man who is trying to obey the law, but doesn't have the heart of Jesus in order to perform that obedience. Many people today, across the globe, and they don't have to be Christian to be trying to obey the moral code. For many of the religions of the world call for honesty, truthfulness, Friendship, kindness, mercy, compassion, love, even sacrifice. However, Romans 7 reminds us that when we try to live under the law, we come up with an extreme conflict. The hearts and the mind says, this is what is morally good and morally right. You must do it. But the ability to perform is another story. Romans 7 portrays the conflict, knowing what is right, but needing to do it and frequently failing on our part to do this. And it ends with this question. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And I love the way the translators got that. They didn't say, what will deliver me? You know, if you're in medicine, you want to give up 
herbs and remedies and pills and, and maybe procedures and surgeries. If you're in another field, you might think that you can just work a new program, a new mental attitude, a new seven or 12 step program. But it is who can deliver me. We need a who, we need a person, we need Jesus. And so this person is spoken of in chapter eight. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Jesus. Wow. The real question is then, are you in him? Is he in you? In Genesis 6, God told Noah, rooms shall you make in the ark and you shall pitch it within and without with pitch. That's Genesis 6, 14, if you want to check it out. Now the word pitch is not about baseball. The word pitch is about tar, and it's the same word used in the Old Testament for atonement. In other words, the ark is a perfect picture of what took place to save Noah and his family. The ark is covered on the outside and the inside with tar that dries to make it waterproof. And God didn't say when the rains began to fall, Noah, listen, I've got eight pegs punched into the sides of the outside of this boat. And you just go out there and you grab hold of one of those pegs and you and your seven other family members, you just hang on for dear life because it's going to be a rough ride. <laughs> no, he did not. He did, said no such thing. He said, go into the ark. The ark is Jesus. And we are not holding on to pegs for dear life, but we are inside the comfort of the one who protects us and keeps us safe for all eternities. The winds will blow, the rain will flow, but we are safe and secure inside Jesus. Are you in Jesus today? Can you say with certainty, he is in you and I am in him? That's one of the hymns that we sing. And we need to be sure that we are in Jesus. John chapter 10, verse 27 to 30, put it this way. My sheep hear my voice, I know them. They follow me, I give to them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father which has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hands. We have, according to the words of the Lord Jesus, a double promise. Not only does the hand of Jesus hold you, but the hand of the Father holds you as well. And of course, the Holy Spirit holds you because Paul says to the believers, we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And the illustration of a sealing is really important because we don't do this today. When was the last time you got a letter with wax sealing? I think I got, I saw one recently. It was the Christmas card and somebody took the time to melt some wax and put a seal on it. It was really pretty. And you could tell it hadn't been opened. And that's the Holy Spirit in our lives. He seals us for eternity. When we do business with God, he says, you're mine. You're my possession. You're my bond slave. You are my possession of forever. And that's why we have eternal life and it's called eternal and not the kind of life that would be holding on and say that I could let go. I could let go of Jesus' hand and I'm gonna, I'm thinking I'm gonna let go now. And he says, you don't, you don't understand. You can't let go. You're not only in my hand, you're not only in the Father's hand, but you are in the body that is him. And you are part of his hand. So you, you can't jump out of what that kind of a sheep ship. And so my sheep hear my voice. Now, just as a reminder that we should never presume too much do you know why this conversation about the sheep comes up? Because there were Pharisees who were doubting him right there at that moment. And he said, two verses before this passage in John chapter 10, verse 27 and following, two verses before, this is what Jesus says. 
I told you, that is the Pharisees, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me, but you do not believe. You're not my sheep, as I said to you. This is powerful. So, are you in Christ Jesus? There is no condemnation. The good news is that the judgment has already been rested satisfactorily upon the Lord Jesus. He died, and my sins were laid upon him. Your sins were laid upon him. And God has said, sin's forgiven. But there's one important aspect that we have as, as individuals. We have to call upon the name of the Lord. That means it's not a little whisper. It means you're calling with desperation in your voice. You're calling seriously. You're calling knowing that if you don't get this right, it's eternity with darkness and with fire and with suffering. You don't want to be wrong on this point. And so, Paul says, no condemnation who now walk, not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So how is your walk going? What's your walk like? If we walk like the flesh, we're living like a dead unbeliever. One of the things that was said recently about those who go into these earthquake zones is the smell of death is so prevalent and it's so strong. And when you smell it, you just want to recoil back from it. It's so strong and it's so sickening. That is walking according to the flesh living according to the flesh, still dead. And the law has no power to help us to obey. It's like a speed sign sitting on the, on the road. It only serves to remind you that you're either too high or too low, but it doesn't give you the power to obey it. Or it's, the law is like a meat fork. I remember seeing a lovely stainless steel meat fork. It's about this long. And it was stuck into a, a turkey that was about almost 15 pounds. And the person who did it said, see, and they stuck it in, they lifted the entire turkey. See, that that's ready, it's ready to be eaten. But if I leave it in too long, I, I'm gonna have a problem doing what I just did right there. Why? Because the flesh starts to weaken. And so the fork is not the problem, that's the law. The flesh is the problem. That is why when David comes to faith in the Lord, he says to this, this, he says, in order for me to obey, I need a clean heart. Psalm 51 verse 10, create in me a clean heart and an upright spirit. Create a new heart. This old heart won't do it. It won't cut what needs to be done. And so what the law could not do, verse 3, and it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin and condemned sin in the flesh so that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. According to the spirit. So what are the things of the spirit? Let's just very quickly think about it. In John 3, 6, that which is born of flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. A new direction. A new direction in life. Born of the spirit. Verse 6, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. The carnal mind is at enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh if the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And so here as we look at it, he says, we are not in the flesh but in the spirit, if the spirit of God dwell in you. Did you know the word dwell oftentimes comes from the word abide, the same root, meno, 
And it's the same word that Jesus says when he says in John 15, abide in me and I in you, dwell in me. So the question is, is the Holy Spirit happy in your home? Can he just come into your home, kick off his shoes or sandals, so to speak, sit on the, the lazy boy or the, or the sofa and just have a good old conversation with you? Because the Spirit of God wants to do that through the living word. Through the word, he wants to take our attention and revet that attention to Jesus. That's the purpose of the Holy Spirit, to make us see Jesus and to see him better. And so we sometimes sing, abide in me. Fast falls the evening tide. We sing that hymn so often. It means dwell in me. God, come into my life. If you haven't done that, maybe it's time. Paul said, he in his writing to the Corinthians, he said, you know, sometimes you guys are dwelling on the wrong things. You're abiding in the wrong things. And then he goes into this long discussion in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 15, about the fellow, a girl who links themselves up with a prostitute. Now, I'm not going to go all into the details, but, but basically, it's something like this. Paul says, when you do that, you're actually making Christ dwell with a prostitute. He uses the word harlot, but let's be honest. How many of you talked about a harlot or heard of that described in the media recently? No, we don't use that word. It's called prostitution. And that's what he says. When you gaze, when you think about these things, why can we say that? Because you've heard it said of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say whoever looks on a woman to lust has already committed adultery with her in the heart. That, that principle applies for what we look at. It applies to pornography, to lusting after some image. This is wrong. And there are degrees that are going on today to try to denigrate society even more. I would suggest that these are activities that we should not be a part of on TV or movie or whatever, because is Christ in you? If he's in you, there's no reason why he would want to be a party to such activity. So brethren, sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of and you cry out, Abba, Father, Abba. That's the Aramaic word for dad. I remember the first time I ever heard, and to this day I've never heard anyone else pray this way. We were on our way to Kansas on a trip, and we were having some car trouble. We had to pull off at a spot. We asked the Lord to get us off the left side of the road and get us into a, a spot. We took the exit and lo and behold, there's a truck, huge, 53 foot trailer on it, Trucker's Chapel. We had come across a ministry going on at one of the truck stops and I went into the place and I said, we've got some problems with our car right now and we don't know what to do. It was overheating, we were having some serious issues. We still had hundreds of miles, thousands of miles actually to go. We said, we don't know what to do. Would you pray for us? And this brother came out and he said, absolutely, absolutely. And he started off, heavenly daddy, please help these folks as they go on their way. And he used the word daddy. And I thought, I've never heard that before. But he was just saying, Abba. He was just using the same term. And it was that intimate term that we reserve for our mom and dad, our, our parents. And you could just tell the love of Christ was flowing from this guy as he was praying for us. We did eventually get all the way to where our, death, our end time was. It took a few more stops along the way, but God was in that entire trip. And uh, yes, Abba Father, do we pray that way? Do we have that intimacy? If Christ is not in you, you are not saved. Romans 8 verse 9. Now, I didn't ask you, nor does Paul, if you've invited Jesus into your life or if you prayed the sinner's prayer. 
He asks you, is Christ in you? Are you in him? Is the Holy Spirit in you? If he's in you, there's no condemnation. But if he's not in you, you have no power to live the Christian life. And so he says, we can pray, Abba, Father. And then he says, and you've been adopted. Now, I'm not sure if there's anybody here that has actually been adopted. My father is the closest I know of to someone that was adopted. He was fostered for many years as, a, an, as an orphan. And adoption is something that's really special in the word of God. Because it says that we have all been adopted into God's family. We have no rights to be in the family of God as children of God. But instead, we've been adopted. We have the legal rights of adoption. We have the, uh, the inheritance of adoption. We receive the benefits of the family. We receive all the benefits of being in God's family. What a wonderful thing it is. We had uh, two foster children stay with us as I was growing up at one point in our, time, in our life as a family. These two little girls had lots of love and a warm home and a loving family around them when they were with us, but they sure didn't trust us. Oh no, they've been hurt and they've been hurt badly. They were unruly, noisy, crying, probably suffering a lot of post-traumatic stress. Um, they weren't comfortable with us at all. But as they got used to the fairness and the consistent love in the home, they soon understood there was no one or nothing to fear. And they became model children. When we are born again into God's family, sometimes we take our experience from our own parents and say, well, that's what my heavenly father's like. He was stern, he was mean, he beat me. I guess that's what God is like. And it's unfortunate, but true, that a lot of Christian fathers take that same imagery and apply it to their child rearing. But the fact is, God's love is full of compassion. When Moses says, let me see your glory, and what does God do in Exodus 33? He walks before him, he hides him in the shadow, in the cleft of the rock, and he proclaims the Lord and the character of God, loving, compassionate, merciful, gracious, um, full of love and compassion. There's a long list there. And, and then lastly, he does talk about a little bit of the judgment of, of God. And the first thing we should remember is how merciful and how loving God is. Well, there's a difference between being adopted and being adapted, you know, that's part of why we call it the Christian walk, because we are being having the rough points chipped off as we move along so that we can become more like the Lord Jesus. The same is true for you. When you come to faith in Jesus, the good news is you are now a child of God. But you may not look like it, you may not act like it, but you are his. And then Paul, as he goes on to say, I consider the sufferings, this is verse 18, of the present time not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And verse 23, not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Well, I thought you said earlier, Dave, that we were adopted. Yes, we are immediately, legally, we are found in Christ. But we're still living in an old body that will have some of the tendencies and some of the old habits and certainly some of the memories, we call them default settings, that will pop up every once in a while. So the key again is letting the Lord Jesus live out his life in our hearts day by day, making spiritual habits out of compassion and mercy and kindness and grace and as a result, we are moving forward. He who spared not his own son, Romans 8.32, but delivered him for up for us all, how shall he not freely with him give us all things? The word spared is the same word in the Old Testament that the Greeks translated when they said to Abraham in Genesis 22, verse 12. 
I know you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son. The Lord did not spare or withhold his son. And Abraham did not withheld hold his son. On that altar, when God came to him and said, Abraham, I've got a task for you. You see that boy over there? He's the promise. He's the one that down through the generations, the Messiah is going to come. The hope of Israel. But I'm going to ask you to do something for me. What, what Lord? I want you to sacrifice him. I want you to sacrifice him. Now, can you imagine that would just boggle my brains to get that as an assignment? Wake up in the morning and see that on my list to do. I, I don't think I could bear to th think that through. And Abraham said it before the Lord and says, I know the Lord is good. I know he's compassionate. I know he's merciful. I know he's the creator. I know he gives life and he takes life away. I know we have no recourse. We have no right to stand before him and say, I have a right to life. We don't have that right because we have sinned and all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I'm sure he thought through all those things. And it says in Romans 4, this gives us a hint of what might have gone on in Abraham's life. He says, Abraham, who is the father of us all, who, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations. So what did he think? I believe Abraham said, you know, Lord, if you call me to execute or to finish off my son, you will bring him back from the dead. You will bring him to life again because you're the author. You can do the impossible. Look at me. I was 100 years old and I knew I could not possibly father a child. Look at Sarah. She was 90 years old. She couldn't father, mother a child. <laughs> And, and yet you brought an impossible situation out of that. You brought a miracle. He is my son, Isaac, brought laughter into her home. But if you call me to do this, I believe that you're going to bring him back from the dead. And that's what happened to Jesus, except he actually died. In Abraham's case, the ram takes the place of the son of promise. In Jesus, he had no ram to take his place. He was the Lamb of God. Wow. And so, we come to the last part of the chapter in Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good. All things. That flat tire, that car that's not working right, that whatever that started leaking, it's all part of of God's plan to make us conform to the image of his son. When Paul wrote Romans 8.28, he does so with making an allusion to Genesis 50, verses 19 and 20, where Joseph says on behalf of God to his brothers, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good. And so it is, when things don't go the way we want them to go, let us remember that nothing can separate us from the love of God.